Thanks a lot. Uh, oh, this is a this is an enigma. Just <laughs> twist it off. <laughs> of course, this is an IQ test, and I fail it immediately. Um, okay. Well, thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, this really means. <laughs> How about now? I'll just lean into it. Um, this really means a lot to me seeing everybody here. It's been such a long time for a lot of us, for a lot of things. But, uh, you know, it's been 14 years since I've had a, a novel out. Um, and so this is kind of a, it's really great to see everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, before we start, I wanted to dedicate this reading, this first reading of this book, to Stan Bidlack, who um, we lost in April. He was uh, uh, my teacher in 1979 at Huron and became my mentor in terms of all things writing, like what degree I should get, where I should go. He helped me apply for uh, write, uh, writing prizes and stuff and, uh, and encouraged me to be a teacher as well. Um, he told me once that he believed that as a teacher he was in the dignity business. Um, and any of you have had, who had him or knew him know he was hands down probably, you know, one of the best educators Ann ever, ever saw. Um, and he became a friend and a neighbor, and uh, he was very excited to be here. And um, uh, over the years, you know, was encouraging, even when I didn't have a new book out, he would order every little story in every little magazine. Um, so anyway, this is for Stan, and as he used to say, let's swing from the trees. Yeah. Um, so this book is, in fact, based on the Wink and Blink and a Nod poem uh, uh, by Eugene Field, in, published in 1889. Uh, does anybody not know this? Don't embarrass yourselves. Um, <laughs> never mind, I retract it. Um, so, um, but it is also a very uh, realistic story about three fishermen in a... Uh, a Skavnigan, which is a little fishing village outside of The Hague in 1889. Um, there's some magic realism, necessarily, because it does follow the general idea of wink and blink and a nod um, flying off into the sky. But it, um, it's essentially just a story of three men trying to band together to build this smaller herring boat, which is a real kind of boat, though it doesn't, it's not supposed to have magical properties. Um, it's called a, a Clavelli Picarooner, and it's uh, how they do herring fishing on a much smaller scale in the Devon town of Clavelli on the other side of England. Uh, but in, in the Netherlands, they use these crazy, giant, oversized crews called bomb shoots, and, and um, it's a very different thing. Um, the first of the three men is Vinken van Winkel, and, or Vin, and he's a war deserter and now opium addict from the Atcha War in Sumatra, uh, where the Dutch were having a very, uh, uh, you know, they were there for the commodities. It's very reminiscent of a lot of things now. Um, they, they were fighting Islamic insurgents who would have this thing called Atcha Mord, which were suicide bombings, and, and it ended in a lot of horrible stuff and uh, a lot of uh, drug addiction and all that good stuff. So anyway, fun. Um, Vin is trying to raise money to keep going further west, to just get further away from where, because he, he's AWOL and, you know. Um, he used to be a very cavalier kind of joker, so he doesn't, he's sort of tongue in cheek, he speaks ironically, he doesn't, he doesn't express himself or tell what's really going on. Um, so, and, and he's always been like the life of the party, you know, kind of a ladies' man, but now he's sort of on the streets and um, not doing as well. He, um, because he speaks sort of out of the corner of his mouth, um, you know, metaphorically, uh, all of his sections are, contain brackets where these aside kind of things are. They're either jokes or the things he keeps to himself or observations that he's not uh, making out loud. So I will attempt to read a little passage in the very beginning that contains that, and maybe you'll hear it the way I read it, maybe you won't. Um, this also contains one of the lines that uh, Greg McIntosh wrote this amazing song based on the book. I got him the, 
Yeah, if you've heard it, it's really beautiful. And one of the lines, I think the first line of the song is maybe the first line of, of my book. So he, he uh, you, it may sound familiar. And there it was, the crashing surf of last light, the sky shutting down for the day over the North Sea, with the herring shoals just beyond. Vin helped push out onto Skevningen Beach, trudging toward the water's edge, heaving against a ridiculously undersized fishing vessel of foreign design and doubtful seaworthiness. This was not where he'd pictured himself being at 29, nearly middle-aged, and back in the place he'd fled, about to attempt this brutal toil all over again, without even the auspices of a properly sanctioned and registered fishing charter, creeping out onto the tidal si sands with Luke Blanken and old Ned as the night seeped over the village, he felt like a housebreaker for fish, but he welcomed it. He knew he was grimacing, acting gruff and annoyed about the whole lunatic scheme, as if he were doing the old man and the boy a big favor just by being there, by having instigated this foolishness. Some perverted part of him didn't want them to know he needed this more than they did. So he made cracks about how he was going to have to spend all his earnings from the catch on a case of liniment and a truss, and japes about their dismal prospects, the doomed nature of their project. It's no matter our young friend here knows nothing about fishing, he said of Luke, the 17-year-old they'd rooked into this venture. That's just fine, Blenkin, because we'll all drown before we can even shoot the first net. So um, the second fisherman is Luke Blenkin. He's 17. Um, he's born to a wealthy whaling company that's just had a, a big financial scandal, but he's not interested in that anyway. He's, he's interested in this woman, Imka, in the fishing village, and he also plays music and writes verse, and he wants to be sort of a man of the people troubadour and sing songs of the sea. So he's trying to finance his musical stuff, but also trying to just be part of this world. And he's very scattered. He has like, um, I believe he has ADD. And so his sections are all M dashes. In fact, some sections just end in the middle of a sentence. Um, so the story follows these three men, um, you know, joining together to build the boat over the winter, but it is not chronological, and I think that's one of the th things that makes it sort of uh, unusual. Uh, a lot of things aren't chronological, but this one is held together by the poem, so that every chapter has a line from the poem that is a header, and as you read, almost like in a sonnet, you hear a repetition, echoes of a word over and over, if it says ruffled the waves of dew, there might be a scene that uses something, something's ruffling or there's the waves of some sort or dew. And so all those visual things are connected to that chapter. You eventually hear the whole story, but it's not chronological. Okay, so now you know it's gonna be difficult. Um, <laughs> so um, this scene I'm gonna read now is again Vin and like I said, he has PTSD, or maybe I implied that. Um, so he doesn't like to sleep at night because it's easier to have night terrors and stuff. And he's sleeping out when it's warm enough. And he's sleeping in, um, you know, stock rooms and things, um, finding his way around. Um, and this section is from, where are you going? Where are you going and what do you wish? The old moon said of the three. We have come to fish for the sailing, failing, the herring fish. I'm getting off. Well, anyway, where are you going is this chapter. So this part is Vin. Where are you going was what Vin said out loud when he ran into Imke Holt near the Kerr house late one night, some months back, maybe in the previous fall. It came out all wrong. He meant to say, say, you're, you, you're young Luke's sweetheart now, aren't you? But he wasn't at his best that evening. In fact, he saw in a flash that the familiarity he'd just shown had been a miscalculation based not on his actual knowledge of the young lady, but only on the fact that Blenkin had been bleating his name like a calf for the last few months, from at least the planing and draw shaving stage on, they're building the boat. But that didn't make her seem someone he, Vin, knew well enough to address in such a direct manner. Noting the uniform, he tried again. How are things at the Majid? Pardon? The Kerr House, are you working there as well? Unless she kept getting discharged from one job after another, this would make at least three that he knew of, having seen her working as a barmaid at the tavern, plus waitressing at one other place. Just started this week, she said. What did you call it? It was a personal joke, referring to the new monstrosity behind them as the Majid Raya Bataraman, the replacement mosque back in Kutaraja. This glitzy resort 
with its bulbous roof like a grand teat offered to the sky, had suffered through a fire back in 85 and been rebuilt. This is the first resort in this place and it was built in when he was, would have been off at the war and it's still there now, but now there's just you know, skyscrapers of hotels. And similarly, the Majid had been a reconstruction. It was an appeasement his fellow countrymen threw up after first invading and raising the original holy place, thinking incorrectly that it was the seat of the Sultan's power, designed by an Italian in the style of India for some reason. The new one back there was also an eyeful, plopped down as if from the heavens, just like this thing on the beach. He shrugged. The Kerr house? She studied him. A little too closely, he felt, to be justified by even the dimness of the moonlight. Are you all right, Vinin van Winkel? Vinken, or Vin, Vink, meaner van Winkel, if you must, that's mister. I think I like Vinken from you. My stodgy father and his ilk stick by Vinin. His dad is a, the astronomer at the Leiden University. Where was I? Oh, yeah. There was a grand moon behind her, and he felt for a moment they were on some metropolitan promenade, Edison lit, where no one ever slept. My late mooder, on the other hand, called me Vinky, unless that's too, let's say, she said, that it definitely is. <laughs> but in, indeed, yeah, I am more than all right. In fact, he wasn't, he wasn't feeling the stomach cramps today or any of the fluctuating ailments of the pipe den, and he was certain she didn't know him well enough to notice, even if it had been showing. Like a dream, that's how I am. Kind of you to ask, how are the big tippers there? She shrugged. They're big tippers, those who are. I don't interact with the guests enough to see any tips, really. He'd always felt Kerr House was an odd name for these grand resorts, the idea of taking the cure here at the seaside. He couldn't imagine anybody who could afford to stay there having anything really in need of curing. He held out his arm for her. Come, I will escort you home at this hour, sending you out into the dark streets. There could be orangutans about. She giggled. So far, I've encountered no orangutans, but I have only been at this job one week. Where I was, he told her, there were orangutans, which was a lot to tell her, more on the subject than he normally divulged. And he recognized that he was saying it like it was another joke, and that he declined to tell her the rest, that when you encountered one lurking in the trees, you would be relieved to discover it was only an orangutan. But in... She insisted he not bother walking her unless it was on his way. He said it was, even though that wasn't accurate, since his loose plan was to probably go to a public park, maybe the Meleveld, where his mother used to take him back when he could barely walk, tottering around even more than he was tonight. And then he tried to sleep in some sheltered edge of the great lawn under the morning stars for at least a little, what was left of the night. But he didn't tell her that. He just mumbled, my place is right around here. He didn't think he always yelped in his sleep now, not every time, but parks were a good place not to cause a ruckus and sleep in peace if a pipe den wasn't easily available or he just didn't want to disappear for most of a day. He wasn't certain where they were heading exactly, but she kept on the Strandweg, heading north along the beach. He didn't remember there being a lot of homes up that way. It was mostly herring pickling and packaging outfits in that direction. He told her some nonsense about their good luck tonight since orangutans were known to shy away from the full moon. They were not, but it was something to say. Or the old moon, I should say. The what now, she asked. Since she bit, he told her. Even my father, who was a renowned expert on all the heavens, just ask him if you doubt that, has no answer for this simple question. Why is it a new moon at the start of the month, but not an old moon later on? Is that even fair? And by extension, are we so afraid of old age that we'd rather say we're full than old? Do you feel old or do you feel full? That's the limit of the options you're offering me, is it? I note the sly undercut. Believe me, young miss. I feel that I'm both old and full. Not so old, she said. You're my sister's age, I believe. Cokey. Cokey Holt? Cokey bunk, bunk now. She remembers you. Ah, yes, he said. Cokey. Yet another one. Still yet another. His heart nearly broke thinking on it. There was a time when even women as fantastic as Cokie Holt had barely drawn his gaze. What a tragedy that so much of your life is wasted on youth, the refuge of the dim-witted and callous. And then, just like that, looming directly before them, it was she in a cowl, the big hood and lantern making her look like the Grim Reaper, only lovely, still lovely. The former Cokie Holt, foul disapproval on her face, but lovely all the same. 
Little sister, she said in a way that seemed to Vin to both chide Imka for walking alone at this hour and to purposefully and perversely ignore the man who was ensuring that Imka wasn't walking alone. It was a barrel full of implication to squeeze into two words, but she managed it. <laughs> he debated whether he should speak up and explain that he was merely escorting Imka in proxy on behalf of her beau and his friend and soon-to-be fishing partner, Luke Blanken. Relax, mother. Imka said, mocking her sister. Not a child, Koki. I'm sure I can handle a few orangutans and an old and bloated moon. For, for a moment, as her kid sister continued on ahead, Koki glared back at him as if he were clearly both of those things the younger one had named. So I'm going uh, to tell you a little bit uh, something about the history of this book, and then I'll read a little section, and then we'll have some questions. Um, much of this is about the night, you know, why I caught a nocturne and my, my relationship with sleep. Um, <laughs> but it's also really a lot about second chances and redemption, which I think is just amazing when I think about how this, story, this book came about. Um, so I think 2008, uh, whenever we had one of those labeled flus, and I got it, like an N1 something or other, the bird flu, and... Um, Huck was a baby, and believe it or not, and um, I um, I was sick on the, and I was just lying on the fireplace hearth, shaking with chills. But I write every day like a maniac, and um, and so I was just writing nonsense in my little blue book, and so this thing basically came to me in a fever dream, and uh, the whole concept of it. I just got down in about two and a half pages. You know, wink and blink and a nod, and then you use the, the poem as the structure, and then you uh, make three characters that are sort of more realistic, and what would their, you know, what would their names be, and what would they, uh, what would they want, and that kind of thing. And, and so I had in these notes this idea of uh, Ned being a, a nod, being a guy named Ned, who, somebody who um, used to be a good fisherman, but had narcolepsy and was so dangerous, dangerous to be working with people and would nod off and they didn't want to work with him and that he slept walk so he you know that was a problem too um, and then I had the further thought well there's going to be magic realism in this um, maybe he also has prescient dreams so he has dreams where he thinks that uh, you know I mean he can see things little glimpses of the future which is if you see the dedication you see my uncle Jim in it who was one of the most brilliant, kindest man ever. Um, he, uh, that's connected to the prescient dreams. That's a, little, that's a little clue to figure out how to read that. Um, anyway, I had all this stuff, but I was, it was basically just a feverish, crazy thing I wrote in my notebook. And then when I got better, I started working on it, you know, on and off. And I work on a lot of things all at once. Many of you probably were hoping or knew, thought that I would finally have my Harry Bennett trilogy here. Um, working on that, working on a lot of things. And I got about 40 to 70 pages of a good chunk in a Word doc. It was scenes, rough scenes and dialogue, and then a little bit of just research and notes and stuff. But I had that. I was working on and off. And 2013, I went to teach at Pacific MFA for the first time. And one morning, I wasn't, I wasn't teaching, so I got up my, I decided to write a story about Rasputin. I don't write a story about Rasputin. Um, <laughs> My computer just went black, <laughs> and I thought, ah, re try rebooting it, no good. And then I thought, oh, great, I know what this is. This is where I have to buy a new computer, and then I have to get someone to put all the stuff on it from onto this, and ah, it's going to be a pain. They couldn't do it. And so then I had the option of sending it out to California. I did this to one of those clean rooms where they dress up like Wonka Vision in the white outfits, and, the, and they, uh, it, it would have cost ten grand if they'd succeeded doing it. And they didn't succeed doing it. They just sent it back to me. It was dead. And I lost a lot of stuff I had um, until Bonnie yelled at me to get um, something better to, to uh, set it up to the cloud. Um, and um, I lost a lot of poems uh, about Huck when he was little that were sort of heartbreaking to lose. But I lost a lot of stuff. And this thing, I thought, I must have printed this out. It's got to be in a box somewhere, so I'm just not going to worry about it. It'll show up, 40 to 70 pages. And um, 
and I never found it. And then 2017, we had that crazy storm in March where it blew hard on a sunny day for an hour, and then the entire Midwest was out of power for five to seven days. This is why uh, DTE is jokingly in the thank yous and the acknowledgments, because <laughs> of their bumbling incompetence. Um, so I, uh, I couldn't get on the computer, so I thought, what can I work on? And I thought, you know, I could just get out that old notebook with the two and a half pages of that wink and blink and a nod thing and just start from scratch. So with candles and yellow pads, I started writing. And it really was cooking because, you know, in the dark, it's 1889. And uh, it's the Netherlands. It's the heavens. It's wherever you want to be. It's your childhood. You get a lot of nostalgic stuff in the dark. Uh, when the power came on, finally, I moved into the bathtub with the bathtub table that uh, some people may have seen 10 years ago. They did a thing on local, uh, like three local writers, and they're writing habits, and there's a picture of me in, in the bathtub with this thing I made. It's, it's ingenious. I got orders from them at Pacific when my students saw the picture. They all wanted one. Um, so anyway, uh, I finished the book that way. Candles in the dark, and, um, and that's where that came from. So I wanted to share that. So it makes me feel like it's right that this book is so much about redemption and that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to read this one section and then I'll take some questions. Hopefully I haven't kept you too long. Where is it? Um, so I told you a little bit about Ned. The only thing else you need to know is that Mevrau means Mrs. And um, he also, uh, anything else about him? There's something else about him. He's 49. He's also known as Agreeable Ned, because Nod, he gets along with people. He just kind of goes along. Um, he's a great guy when he's awake. Um, but he, um, he's 49, which was the, that year was the life expectancy for males in, in that part of the Netherlands. It's amazing. So this is something about happened before this story, basically. This is kind of a flashback. Getting married, am I standing close enough to them? I'm having to kind of lean over this. We good? Okay. Getting married was never anything netted. Oh, again, um, the punctuation here is ellipses. So hopefully it won't be too annoying as I read it like I'm drifting off. <laughs> Getting married was never anything Ned had wished for. Bachelor fisherman would have been fine, he'd thought. Bachelor farmer when the herring boats became impractical for him. This was just one reason he knew his union made little sense to folks in the, fish, in the village market or when he brought his little brood to church, though he was sure they knew the story by now. The whispering and clucking that fluttered around them like chickens in the dooryard. Back then, when it was all fresh, had long since subsided, but certainly they all still recalled the rumors. Ned never gave a hang about that, except that it likely bothered dear Fenna. She deserved better treatment from the wags and fence line gossips, and better yet, in terms of husband material. He was more than old enough to be her father, when the lads on the beach and in the taverns, initially for a time, chose to josh and make their japes, Along the lines of him being a cradle robber and lecher, he let it go, though, or pretended he hadn't heard them, or even once or twice faked one of his dozing spells. You couldn't be hurt by snickering or turtles that you were not awake to hear. But the truth was, he hadn't been a leering suitor, not at all. In fact, immediately after the strange encounter that ended his bachelorhood, he had trouble recalling ever laying eyes on her before at least not with any particular lingering. He'd known her folks, of course, though only by name, maybe to nod to her father passing in his cart. But Fenna, though a vision, sure, fair-haired and lovely, hadn't been in his sights, wouldn't have been, couldn't have been. What it was, the culprit in this, was the sleepwalking. His night wanderings, as he thought of them, were an embarrassment at least, a shock upon waking, an inconvenience, and uncomfortable, though sometimes he made it into bedrooms. And that's how he found himself, preposterously in his early 40s, waking up next to a beautiful, astonished young lady. The corn silk hair in the bright light through a garden window was the first thing that was clear, but then the girl, the consternation. He was still in his work clothes and lying on top of the counterpane. And yet that didn't seem to assuage the girl's parents standing in the doorway of her tiny bedroom nor the girl's younger sister co covering her face, cowering in the adjoining trundle bed. 
He proposed marriage that afternoon before finally exiting their house. Having sat with the father for hours at their kitchen table negotiating, he hadn't laid a finger on the girl. They both swore and her father seemed to believe them. But there was the issue of the neighbors, the community. The man was insistent in a way that surprised Ned a little. Couldn't he simply knock on a few of their neighbors' doors and explain what had happened, that he'd been sleepwalking? People, he found, were generally very pleasant. Wouldn't they understand? <laughs> Mainly, he was thinking of the girl, concerned she could do a lot better than an old herring man like him, one who sometimes couldn't end the night in the same bed where he started it. But the father was adamant. Of course, he didn't regret it. He'd never planned to marry. But if he were going to do it, it would be hard to imagine landing a wife quite so lovely and young. And though she didn't seem particularly unhappy all these years later, it was hard sometimes not to feel a little sorry for her, as well as hopeful in an odd way that he might find some way, someday, to make it up to her, to compensate her for the intrusion and the inconsiderate turn he'd done her in making her Mevrau Ned Nodder. So I'm going to stop there. It's, there's a lot more to the book, of course. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more to it, but um, that's a little taste. So I'll take some questions if there are any, or comments, or, and then I'll sign books if you want me to. Are there any questions? Bonnie. Yeah, there are, they, they, it is, and nobody really knows about it. I mean, I don't know, they, they, they know about it there, but we don't know about it that much. And there were only a few books I could find about it. It also went on forever. I think the Atcha War had a whole bunch of different distinct periods. But if, does somebody else know? I think it went into like, the, it went into the early part of the 20th century. Well, it was the, it was the Dutch, K N I L was the army. But you mean what we call it the Dutch Achenese War? I don't know. Probably the Sumatran War, maybe. And also discovered that Sumatra is just amazing. Uh, you know, it's part of Indonesia now, but um, it's just beautiful. And some of the some of the parallels to our recent wars are just amazing and the, how stupid they were and we don't seem much brighter. They blew up this mosque thinking that that's the seat of government and then they said sorry and replaced it with something that looked like it was from India. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. No I didn't. I found out about it. I'm trying to remember. Oh, sorry. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, they are. They're streaming this. I should have warned people. If you're uh, if you're hiding from the government or anything, duck out now. Put a tinfoil hat over your head. Um, I don't. I don't know a lot about it. I'd like to know more about it, but then again, I wouldn't. It seems pretty pretty crazy and horrible. And there was a lot of a lot of war crimes on the part of the the Dutch. Richard, do you have a question? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a ringing endorsement. <laughs> Scott. Hey, Steve. I know everyone here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Great presentation. Um, Thank you. And throughout, you spoke to how the unconscious speaks to the motivations for the given characters. And I'm wondering if you can speak to how the if you have a broad concept, an overview of how the unconscious speaks to how we are motivated through our journeys in life and how that actually adapted to the book. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's no problem. That's an easy question. 
Um, so I need to quickly become a major philosopher. Um, how do they are unconscious? Uh, I don't know what, but I mean, I guess maybe I'm not answering your question, but um, it is an unusual place for me to start a story with something that's clearly coming out of a fuzzy head. I mean, that's, so I don't usually start in that much of an unconscious place. Um, but I do find that motivation of characters feels very unconscious to me. That if I can make a character sharp enough and I know generally what they want, I can, I can put it down on a piece of paper as a real specific drive, then I just unconsciously know what they want in any scene. I mean, it feels like that's just an innate thing of being a human, um, but it doesn't require the same thinking as uh, plotting out where it fits in the war and that kind of stuff. That's a very other side of the brain. Uh, you know, I don't think I'm driving. When I, when, I, when, I, when I deal with motivation of characters, I don't feel that I'm at the wheel. And, and that's very important. But you're asking about in life. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> if I figured it out. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Scott. I've got a, that's a terrible answer. Oh, OK. Well, you, you get back to me. I, I do think we can figure out little, little bits of it. And that's probably why I write. You can figure out little sections of the world for a moment, you know, and, and then the rest is just chaos. <laughs> okay, I got a question. Yes. <laughs> um, you talked a little bit about uh, the candles and the legal pads, the yellow pads, yeah. and you talked about writing the bathtub. I haven't seen this video about you as a writer. That's not a video. Oh, it's not? It's a yeah. story? Okay. <laughs> We're going to need a bibliography. It's a, it's a We're going to have to get the detail there. Around. But could you talk a little bit about how you talk to your students about the act of writing and the need to withdraw? Or how do you find the time or space? Or what, what processes do you use to go I, inside to actually do that work? I saw a former student here, but I don't know if he wants to get up and talk. Yeah, Kevin, go ahead. Do you want to talk? No, OK. <laughs> uh, Kevin was at uh, Pacific MFA out in Oregon with me. Um, uh, Give it to me again, some short, short end. When your students would tap into, like, the work that you do to go inside and, and, and even create that, like, and have that focus. Well, I'm becoming more and more scattered and easily distracted. So that chamber of the darkness was really helpful. I do find there was another book I wrote in the bathtub that was about childhood and stuff. And that's another time. That's a time capsule. The bathtub doesn't change much. I mean, you should change your tile once in a while. But it's basically 1966 or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do, I do use non-lyrical music. Um, I couldn't find any true Sumatran music uh, on the fly during a, during a, uh, a blackout. But I did find, uh, that's where I first discovered Bombino. Um, who's the Turek guitar player. Um, and I played that throughout the whole thing. It's very trance-like, and, and um, it's amazing. And we went to see him when Huck was younger, and he met him and stuff. And, um, uh, but I, I do use music to transport myself sometimes, and to block stuff out. That's a very pedestrian question, but you started asking about office supplies. So that's pretty pedestrian. <laughs> It doesn't have to be more philosophical. It's not Scott's question, that's for sure. <laughs> Dave. Oh. I'll wait for the other one. Okay. Yeah. Rest Thank your you. voice. I, I have an easier question. Sorry. Um, if you had the 40 to three. 70. The answer is three. Yeah, great. Thank you. If you had the 40 to 70 pages back, what would be the correlation with what you produced? They'd probably have slightly different names. There'd be something that would surprise me, like, he's going to do what? Yeah, there would be things in there that are wrong. I do find when I lose a scene and then I found it, I've usually written what looks like an edited better version. If it happens within you know, a couple of days, um, it's pretty close, but it's better, usually. But years later, I don't know. It might be crazy, like, you know, there could be craziness in there. 
But the essential things were in the notes. And those names weren't even, didn't remain. I looked up real names and I thought, well, that's not a, this is a real name, a real Dutch name. And, you know, I, I worked it a little, but uh, it helped to have that springboard. Keith. Are we ever going to see Harry Bennett again? Yeah. Are we? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I got to get a publisher who's willing to do a trilogy because it's a trilogy. <laughs> so I got I to gotta get back out there with this. Um, it's pretty crazy, and the stuff I've uncovered for that is just insane. I, I do worry that I will expire before I reveal some of the things I uncovered about him. And I have to just grip my teeth when I hear a bunch of kind of myths about him that aren't true. Um, there's one in the back. Hi, thanks for this um, quick question. How did you um, learn about the Dutch heritage back in the late, uh, you know, uh, 1800s. Did you go? Have you been in the Netherlands? I have Did you not. have I was inspiration from other to Dutch go, people? And then the COVID happened. But um, no, I talked to, I, at various stages, I did talk to some people who are alive, not from that era. Um, I read, I looked in books and I looked, and there are some good cultural websites as well. Um, it's, you know, it may seem like a lot for somebody who isn't Dutch, I'm not Dutch, it may seem like a lot of stuff in there, and then to somebody who's Dutch, it might seem like it's very sparse. Um, but, you know, there was even, there was a pass with, the, with this publisher where she found, the, the publisher found some, some experts to vet it, which was good, it made me less nervous about that, faking it. Uh, <laughs> it's usually a combination of those things. Um, and you always stumble across something and you think that you find that is incredibly specific to what you're looking for when you've given up and you can't find anything and then there's just this trove of some specific thing and that's it, it it's important to resist using that just because it's juicy you know um as you do with historical novels so i think it's very light in the historical thing but it's enough to be realistic so that it really feels. I, and I also didn't pursue magic realism. I wasn't trying to do that originally. I mean, I'm not, I remember it a lot in the 80s when I was in grad school, the Milagro Beanfield Wars and all that stuff. Um, it wasn't something I set out to do. So, you know, um, I wasn't trying to do that, but it has to be. You know, to me, things need to be as visual. If you can believe the room you're in, then the chairs, then you believe the character that's sitting in the chair. So just get the furniture right a little bit. <laughs> hey, Tim. <laughs> Tim, Tim released his CD last night. I'm doing a reverse plug because you <laughs> plugged me twice at the arc last night. Thanks, buddy. It was so beautiful and amazing. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the book jumps around uh, 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 different, you know, times. Well, yeah. Do you write narr I mean, do you write linearly? Generally, you know, was this written in sections? Do you kind of piece out? I, I, I've see I write the parts I can see. Okay. So there's so there's usually a linear manuscript eventually that has holes in it and dashes, and then I know the scene probably. And and sometimes I'll start a scene and it'll say somewhere. Okay, so you, you know, put like placeholder type. Yeah, I'll move it. This doesn't go here, but it's going to go somewhere, and then I'll move it around. But eventually, it becomes like I know it's that scene, but it just. And then one day, I'll just. It's kind of like I've heard Hitchcock talk about when he he would direct, he would sort of dream the scene. I kind of get that. I kind of get that. Like I know there's a scene where this happens, but I don't see it. I don't see like the room and stuff. I don't get the dialogue. And then one day, I'll just think like, oh yeah, that scene. I can do that scene. You so know, do you have... It's not, it's not outlined totally, right. but, but I know there's some vague scenes that I have to get to, and they pop up when they do. And I try to lay them out in the order, but there's big gaps in between. Do you write those scenes? Do you kind of have like a little, you know, a box you kind of put scrap parts in that you pull, pull out later and try to find a place for them? That or? scrap box thing usually happens when I start working with an editor. Cause, and it happened this time because I cut some things, and then I said, well, there's this, and then pop it back in, and, you know. Okay. But we should have something where it does this. How about this thing we cut? <laughs> so, uh, awesome, thanks. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Two questions from Bonnie. She deserves it. Well, I, I'm very curious. It sounds as though you worked a lot with an editor on this. It sounds as though it was, well, I think it's a rare and wonderful thing. I don't know how many of you are in the publishing world, but you don't get a lot of editing nowadays. And it sounds like you had very good editing. I don't, yeah, I'm I had a couple you... experiences on this. Oh. <laughs> Maybe you didn't love them. <laughs> no, no, I did. I did. It, it was great. Um, but this, uh, there's been a real journey with this book. Let me say that. <laughs> No, I, I really believe in the editing process. I think it's like, uh, I remember my first book, and people said, like, did they make you cut anything? Somebody asked me that once. <laughs> After I was done laughing, I, I, I said, you know, I mean, it's a collaboration with the world. If you want to write by yourself, then don't even bother publishing it. Just read it to yourself in the basement. Uh, <laughs> the reader is part of the collaboration, and the editing is, uh, I've had great editors in, in my life. Um, so, uh, <laughs> that, so yeah, no, I mean, I welcome that. It's not always easy, but um, um, this went through a lot of changes even before it got here. Uh, it was a long journey to get to, uh, to Acre, which is a new publisher for me. Anybody else? I guess that's it, um, right? Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. It's nice to see everybody. And if I if I get COVID tonight, it wouldn't have been from a nicer group of people. Couldn't have been.